Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. This is Amy Hewitt. I am the Executive Director of the Scleroderma Research Foundation. Uh, we're pleased to have you with us for today's session, Skeletal Myopathy and Systemic Sclerosis. Um, for all of us at the SRF, it's really an honor to be able to provide this forum for you um, and educate the, the community about um, the different aspects of the disease. Um, a little bit about today's session. We'll feature 40 minutes or so on the neuro neuromuscular manifestations of scleroderma scleroderma, and then we'll wrap up with about 15 minutes of Q&A time. Um, the phone lines have all been muted, so if you have a question, please use the chat box in the conference window. Um, one thing I'd like to note before we get started is that um, please remember all of our webinars are for educa educational purposes only, and no information provided is to be considered personal medical advice. It's now my pleasure to introduce our special guest. Dr. Julie Paik is currently the Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Rheumatology at Johns Hopkins University. She completed her undergraduate degree at Hopkins and medical degree at George Washington University School of Medicine. Thereafter, she pursued her internal medicine residency at UCLA Cedars-Sinai West LA, the VA Medical Center, uh, where she served an additional year as chief resident. After completing her fellowship training in rheumatology at Hopkins, she transitioned to the faculty. Uh, her clinical research interests are focused on neuromuscular manifestations of autoimmune diseases, particularly in the areas of myositis and scleroderma. The focus of Dr. Paik's current research efforts are in determining the prevalence of neuropathy and myopathy in scleroderma patients, with her clinical practice focused on the broad range of autoimmune and inflammatory muscle diseases in rheumatology. Um, her emphasis on the neuromuscular manifestations of scleroderma uh, makes her uniquely qualified to lead today's topic. It's now my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Julie and skeletal myopathy and systemic sclerosis. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Um, <clears throat> I apologize in advance for my voice. I got something for my kids, and so it's a little bit raspy, but I think you can hear me um, clearly, hopefully. You sound great. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right so I'm going to turn enjoy. it over to you. Go ahead and get started. <laughs> okay. So we'll get started. So I know uh, Amy mentioned uh, I focus in neuromuscular manifestations of scleroderma. I'm really going to focus my talk on muscle disease in scleroderma. Um, so I'm going to get started. <clears throat> so I don't have any disclosures. Um, any of the copyrighted material, it's just for educational purposes, um, so any distribution is prohibited. So the objectives of my talk today is to first define myopathy and its clinical presentation, and then to describe the evaluation of muscle weakness in scleroderma, and then to describe the epidemiology of uh, muscle disease or skeletal myopathy in scleroderma and highlight recent studies of myopathy in scleroderma. And to describe a unique subset of patients with fibrosing myopathy, you're probably wondering what that is. And so I will go into that in detail later. So I wanted to start off with basic definitions of what is myopathy. I get this question a lot from my patients. Um, so basically, it just means a generic muscle disease, just like if someone would say, oh, I have a rash, we don't know what kind of rash you have. So the Greek term would be myo, meaning muscle, and uh, pathy, meaning suffering, um, the disease of the muscle in which the muscle fibers improperly function. And you can see the muscle is, you know, tightly bound to the bones, and there's tendons, there's fascia, there's all these blood vessels that course through the muscle. And so uh, it can be quite complex in trying to figure out what is causing someone to get muscle weakness or muscle disease uh, with it. <clears throat> and I wanted to highlight also that while we think about the muscle, we're thinking only about skeletal muscle, and that is what I'm talking about today, there's also um, cardiac muscle, and that is also muscle. So if some of my patients do get skeletal muscle disease, but then that also can commonly uh, causes um, inflammation in the muscle, which in the heart muscle. And so you can get inflammation of the heart muscle uh, in conjunction with skeletal muscle. And then to clearly differentiate that the gut in scleroderma is different. There's no skeletal muscle there. It's just smooth muscle. And so um, we don't expect uh, certainly to get GI manifestations like in the small bowel or large intestines from uh, skeletal muscle disease because there's no skeletal muscle there. <clears throat> Okay, so what about the symptoms? Well, how do I know if I have myopathy or myositis? I guess I should have also said the definition of myositis is actually inflammation of the muscle. Myopathy is just muscle disease, and myositis is a subset of myopathy. And I have a schematic later, so it'll be a little more clear if there's any confusion. So sometimes uh, our patients will be like, well, what kind of symptoms would I typically get? 
And the typical symptoms is proximal muscle weakness. And this how we define it is, okay, when the physician is examining you, it's very important to figure out where is my weakness. The pattern of weakness is very important. So in scleroderma-associated muscle disease, what we typically see is that you get proximal muscle weakness, just like the other patients who have uh, polymyositis or dermatomyositis, a form of myositis. So it's typically going to be difficulty going upstairs. Um, some core weakness can also happen because of the severe weakness in the thighs, and raising arms overhead would be also difficult. So my patients will sometimes say, I'm trying to just get some dishes overhead, and I can't reach over there. And this is unrelated to any contractures that, may, that you may have. Um, although I did say that the uh, gut in the uh, like small intestine and large intestine, there's no skeletal muscle there, there is some in the esophagus. So we do have patients, aside from you know, scleroderma-related GI disease, you can also get dysphagia if you have skeletal muscle involvement. And then I have in a, uh, other patients who will say, well, I'm very active. I you know, walk 10 miles a day. I really don't feel weak. Um, but some of my patients have noticed actually low muscle endurance. So before I was able to walk a mile in so, so and so minutes, but now I can only do it, you know, it takes me like double the time or something like this. So muscle endurance is something that we forget about, um, but that certainly could be an early manifestation of a muscle problem in scleroderma. Okay, so what do we know to date about scleroderma muscle disease? If we go back, um, back into the 60s, in fact, um, <clears throat> there's not a lot that we know, but because we don't know that much, you can see that the prevalence of muscle weakness in scleroderma varies from 5 to 95%. I mean, that's a very broad range. And that's because there's no true diagnostic consensus criteria uh, among the scleroderma experts, so to speak. Um, there was a more recent study that was done, uh, a meta-analysis, where they look at all the studies that was published since the 60s or 50s. Um, and they found that potentially in their definition of what muscle disease was, about 25% of patients with scleroderma will develop skeletal myopathy. And how, as I said, because the diagnostic criteria, consensus criteria is not available at this time, um, how they define skeletal myopathy is very important. Some people will say, oh, it's just if you have weakness, but that's not really correct. Um, you want to have more objective evidence of a true muscle problem. And so I will go into how we evaluate for um, uh, true muscle disease. And some of those uh, things that I mentioned, the third bullet point would be, you know, the elevation of muscle enzymes, EMG, MRI, or muscle biopsy. And I also wanted to highlight we don't know a lot, but we, one thing we do know is that um, it's a very underappreciated manifestation of scleroderma, but there is data to support that people who have muscle disease is a poor prognostic feature in scleroderma. Um, and one of the uh, more recent studies in 2014 from Canada, from Dr. Pope's group, showed that when they looked at their cohort of 1,145 patients, um, they, you can see that's a poor prognostic feature, and in fact, it could impact survival. And that was especially seen in men or in early diffuse scleroderma or those who have uh, SCL70 antibodies, some specific antibodies, and if you had interstitial lung disease. And again, here they defined muscle disease simply as if you had an elevated muscle enzyme, which may indicate you have muscle inflammation. And I'll discuss um, briefly what the workup is in terms of figuring out if somebody has a muscle disease. Okay, so <clears throat> to orient ourselves and not get confused, again, myopathy is muscle disease, and just like we would say rash, it's a very generic term for muscle disease. You can have myopathy for any other many, many, many reasons. And to make it more simplified, I wrote down in this, or I drew this schematic showing that certainly you can have other uh, reasons for a myopathy, for example, a genetic muscle disease. So in fact, I saw a patient um, in the scleroderma center who had a facial weakness, and they thought it was from the scleroderma, but um, in fact, she had adult onset uh, FSHD, which is a genetic muscle disease. So it was really surprising, but we can't just say if you have some weakness, um, it's all from the scleroderma. You want to figure out what is the reason for the muscle disease. So in her case, it was a genetic muscle disease. So we want to keep that in our uh, differential, so to speak. Other things would be if you were hospitalized for a week, you get really weak. So certainly if someone uh, was 
uh, not able to move as well because they were hospitalized or from disuse, you can also get muscle disease. Um, the third thing I put in the middle, and the reason I put it in the middle is because this is the one that I will describe in more detail at the end of the unique subset of patients in our cohort who have this fibrosing myopathy where actually we think this is more unique to scleroderma. Um, and I will show you pictures of that, what I mean. And other causes would be neurologic um, causes. So for example, ALS or um, uh, other neurologic like CIDP, which is another autoimmune inflammatory disease that affects the nerves. And that could also cause weakness. And the other thing uh, would be another autoimmune muscle disease um, separate from scleroderma. So this gets a little bit confusing because then you can say, well, myositis is a cousin of scleroderma, but we do have patients who have both diseases. So this week gets a little bit, so we call it overlap. So <clears throat> if we have a scleroderma patient who has weakness, we also want to figure out, do they have overlap to autoimmune conditions where you have myositis in addition? And in the myositis world, there's four main um, types of myositis, and this is polymyositis, um, dermatomyositis, inclusion body myositis, and the more recently described immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. Um, and I will go into a little more detail about those things. But interestingly enough, in the world of myositis, about 40%, we take away the scleroderma part of it, 40% of our patients with myositis, the most common overlap is scleroderma. So I think that's how I'm uniquely positioned in a sense to see a lot of these patients because, you know, we both at Hopkins, we have scleroderma and myositis centers, and we can um, uh, appropriately and comprehensively evaluate for both conditions. Okay, so that's a schematic. So going back to the evaluation of myopathy, so again, where you're weak, the pattern of muscle weakness, is it the proximal muscles, the short shoulder muscles, um, the pelvic girdle is important compared to distal muscles, just the hands or just the face or something like this, or just the, uh, in, just, just the ankle dorsiflexors, or for example, if just somebody has, um, uh, has a foot drop, that be, you would think is from muscle weakness, but certainly uh, you want to have a workup for that as well. So one of the uh, first workups would be, again, the physician examining you to determine the pattern of muscle weakness. Second would be um, the physician will typically draw some blood to figure out if you have elevated muscle enzymes. And the most common ones and more specific than anything else would be a creatinine kinase, a CK, or some doctors call it CPK or CK, and then aldolase. And this, it, when you draw it um, in the blood, you can tell if it's very elevated, we're concerned that there's muscle inflammation. And it leaks out from the muscle if there's inflammation into the blood, and that's why you would see really high levels of it. So normal CK is less than 200. Normal aldolase in most labs is about 8.1. So anything above 200 or anything above 8.1 and you have weakness, then we start thinking, is there a muscle problem going on that's making you weak? And it's not just, you know, because I don't work out or something like this. The third thing would be... <clears throat> Uh, EMG and nerve conduction study, which is uh, a neurologic study to determine if you have a muscle problem or a nerve problem or both that's making you weak. Um, a fourth would be uh, MRI of the muscles. Fifth would be a muscle biopsy. And then sixth would be uh, blood test for autoantibodies. And I'm sure uh, you're well aware of, you know, these type of blood tests we can uh, check to see if you have a scleroderma-specific a marker of a scleroderma disease, for example, an SCL70 or, you know, centromere antibody in your blood. So um, there are some of these blood tests that are commonly seen in patients who have both muscle disease and scleroderma. So I am going to go a little bit more detail. So if your physician does, you know, want to order additional tests, it's kind of, um, I think it's important to you for uh, my patients, I always tell them about what this test entails and why we're doing it and not just order it. So uh, the EMG, again, is, um, or nerve conduction study is two parts. So we just have to remember that um, the nerve comes out of the spine and communicates with the muscle. So if the nerve is damaged or inflamed or um, hurt or is not working well, then it cannot transmit that information to the muscle. So this is a good example of, wait, I'm just going to try to use the point, pointer here again. 
this would be a good example where you can see that the nerve is, you know, communicating and sending signals um, to the muscle fibers. And that's important so that you can start moving your muscles. So if you had a true nerve problem, then you can actually have muscle weakness, right? So a classic example would be if, and there's two, you know, nerves in our system. There's the motor nerves and the sensory no nerves. So the motor nerves are important to actually have your muscles move. And the sensory nerves are important to have feeling. So if you have like numbness or tingling, those sensory nerves are probably abnormal. So the classic example of why someone would be weak because of nerve damage would be, you know, patients who have diabetes and have neuropathy. Or more, uh, a severe example would be someone with ALS, right? In ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, you have the motor nerves are not functioning and you get weakness in the muscles, and you can even get muscle atrophy. So in fact, I've unfortunately diagnosed four people um, in the past several years with ALS, but they were misdiagnosed as myositis because they had a CK that was very high. And, um, and sometimes in ALS, early findings on EMG is uh, very hard to pick up on. And they were being treated with steroids, which is not a, obviously not a treatment for ALS. And so uh, this is another reason why we do this EMG and nerve conduction study to determine if the weakness is coming from the nerve because the nerve is not appropriately communicating to the muscle, and that's the nerve conduction part to test your nerves. And then the muscle part or the electromyography part um, is when they actually put a very tiny needle. I know it sounds a little painful, <laughs> but um, actually the, you know, did it on myself part of a research study, and it wasn't too bad. <laughs> but um, you put in a tiny needle in the muscle, not in every single muscle fiber, but in certain areas, the key areas, and um, you determine if the muscle fibers are appropriately responding. So actually, when you put the needle in, you should be completely silent. So that needle gives us a microphone into what your muscle sounds like. And if it's not inflamed, you shouldn't hear anything at all. But if it is inflamed, it's irritated. So we call it an irritable myopathy on EMG. Um, and <clears throat> so we look for those findings. If there's a lot of inflammation or if it's a lot of irritation, then we will see that on the EMG and give us supportive evidence that there's a muscle problem going on. Okay, I'm just gonna go to the next slide, if I can do this. Okay, now, the next would be um, the MRI of the muscle. So this seems like a lot, but the top, just focus on the top, is normal. So the reason why we do the MRI of the muscles, and this does not include any contrast, so we don't have to worry about gadolinium being given into your IV. But basically what we do, let's remind ourselves about um, the anatomy of the muscle. So the anatomy, or from the skin going down into the muscle. So the top layer is really the skin, right? And underneath you have the fat, sub-Q fat. And then underneath that, you have the fascia. Okay. Fascia is if you were trying to buy meat at the market. This is how I explain it to my patients. Um, you, you know, when you buy meat at the market, there's that layering, that slight, like, thin layering that kind of peels off, and that's the fascia. So that is on top of the muscle. And then right underneath that is the muscle. And so the MRI, unlike the EMG, you can take a whole, you know, picture of your entire thighs. And we can determine if there's actually muscle inflammation there. But we can also tell if there's fasciitis. Fasciitis will not cause your muscle enzymes in your blood that we talked about, the CK and aldolase, to go up because it's not a muscle. It's not going to be, even though it's inflamed, it's not going to release anything into the blood. So the MRI is going to be the only one that can actually pick this up, and the EMG cannot. And on another note, while the EMG is like a, some of my patients have called it a torture test, I don't think it's a torture test, but certainly it would be a torture test if you had to put a needle in almost every single muscle fiber, right? But the muscle MRI, you know, doesn't require any needles. You can actually just take a picture and determine and find out exactly where the muscle edema is. Okay. So in the normal, um, you can see in this one, let's talk about the STIRT images first. STIRT images basically suppressed, we're suppressing the fat. So here, you're not going to see, you know, the fat that's around on the T1 images. But basically, you're suppressing the fat so you can see any inflammation. So if there's inflammation or edema, it's going to look really bright. So the classic example of a lot of muscle inflammation or edema would be in dermatomyositis. 
So you can see here, um, this is all muscle inflammation. All this bright white. And then here, remember I said that the fascia is just like right on top of the muscle. And so you can see the fasciitis right here. Uh, like almost as if you were using a coloring book, I tell, like with my kids, and you highlight around the muscle, and you can see it's very uh, like outlined uh, around the muscle. That's fasciitis. Um, <clears throat> so that's the edema or inflammation. So if there's a lot of muscle inflammation, we can see it on the MRI. The T1 images is important because we're looking now, forget about the inflammation. Now we want to know if you had this muscle disease for years and you were not treated appropriately for it, then what can happen is the muscle will turn into fat. When muscle turns into fat, that's unfortunately irrever irreversible damage. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do about that. And so we want to avoid that. Um, so people who get fatty replacement typically is if you have a severe muscle disease like myositis or uh, for example, like you can see example in inclusion body myositis, or kids with muscular dystrophy, like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, will get fatty replacement because it's a genetic defect, and there's not much, we cannot reverse that genetic defect. Um, but I do have patients who have more severe myositis who will also get fatty replacement because they weren't treated appropriately um, and you know, not treated early enough. And so T1 is really only looking for fat. Uh, replacement. And so some of my patients will be like, oh, we're looking at this together in the clinic, and I review these things with my patients together, and you'll see that, oh, it looks like a piece of steak, Dr. Pack, and I'm like, it, it kind of does look like that. So it's kind of interesting to explain it like that, but I think it's a great example that my patient said, because actually you want a well-marbleized steak, but you don't want tons of fat in it, because certainly that would not be ideal when you're trying to eat a steak. But again, um, the fatty replacement is something we truly want to avoid in uh, muscle disease. Okay, so next slide. So, you know, uh, the next typical uh, workup we do, depending on um, what we see on the muscle MRI and the EMG, we want to do a muscle biopsy. Uh, not always, and I know our patients with scleroderma tend to have tighter skin, so um, some people are worried about healing, but, I mean, really we haven't had any... Um, problems in doing the muscle biopsy. I think you just want to have someone who knows how to do it properly uh, when you do it. Um, and again, one other thing, the reason the MRI is very helpful for us is that, you know, when you see the muscle edema, you want to, uh, sometimes our disease, the muscle disease can be patchy. And if it's patchy, well, you don't want to uh, biopsy normal muscle tissue because then it's just a waste of trying to do a muscle uh, biopsy and you're going to be left with a scar and you're like, well, what, what's going on in my muscles? So the MRI is very helpful to uh, localize the area of the most intense inflammation. Um, and then, for example, if I was looking at this MRI picture, I would say, well, I mean, this has a lot of muscle edema, but you can probably biopsy here or here. And I would tell the surgeon exactly where to go. I can exactly tell them on the MRI, okay, you know, two centimeters above the, you know, upper aspect of the knee, and we can measure it exactly out so we get the best sample, and we're not wasting um, time and um, healing and all this stuff to do another uh, muscle biopsy. So that's another reason why the MRI is very helpful. So I love the muscle because the muscle, I didn't I'll tell you uh, on the previous slide, is that muscle can regenerate. So we're born with these satellite cells at birth. So if the muscle is inflamed, and it's treatable, and if we treat it appropriately, muscle will regenerate, and you will not get fatty replacement. But if you don't treat it, and there's all this inflammation, or if there's a, genet or if there's a genetic muscle disease, muscle will gradually turn into fat because we're not either providing treatment or there is no available treatment in kids with muscular dystrophy. So that's the good news about the muscle. You can regenerate and um, get better. Um, <clears throat> so this is just an example of normal muscle tissue. It's healthy, um, and I'll show you examples of other uh, muscle disease states. So you'll, I just want to put in perspective that this is normal tissue, and this is entire muscle fiber with the mo tiny myofibers in here in a big fascicle group of muscle myofibers. And the nuclei or the center of where all um, the action is going on is typically around the uh, myofiber. Okay. 
And then uh, we don't want to forget about the autoantibodies. Um, in myositis, I didn't put a slide because in myositis, um, a form of myopathy we discussed as a schematic before, um, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's probably at least 20 or more uh, myositis autoantibodies. Just like scleroderma, we know that if you have more uh, muscle involvement, we typically look for um, this PM SEL, which is poly stands for polymyositis or dermatomyositis overlap with scleroderma. So people with this antibody in, in the scleroderma world typically will get more muscle involvement. But I have to tell you, and I will show you some of the studies we've done, that um, we do see muscle involvement even in you know these other auto uh, other autoantibodies in scleroderma, so fibrillin. Um, we've seen patients who have this autoantibody and also get pretty severe muscle disease. We've also seen people who get muscle disease in those who have this autoantibody. And these autoantibodies are important because it tells us what kind of clinical presentation you may have, right? And so um, this is another reason why we order these antibodies um, in scleroderma, and if I see you, we typically also order the myositis autoantibody panel because I do actually have patients who have, you know, SCL70 antibody and JO1 antibody, which is a different uh, myositis autoantibody. So you could have two. It's very, very, very rare, but certainly uh, we wouldn't want to miss that because then your presentation, we would want to look for certain things and um, be more uh, dil diligent about looking for other organ involvement. Okay, so just to put it in perspective and to review again, um, again, to evaluate for muscle disease, you want your physician to examine you for weakness. In scleroderma-associated muscle disease, typically it's the pattern of involvement is proximal muscles, and then um, the workup usually is muscle enzymes in the blood, like CK and aldolase. The EMG is very helpful to determine if it's a nerve problem or a muscle problem. Um, the MRI of the muscles is very helpful to look for inflammation. Um, and any chronic damage like fatty replacement. And then, you know, uh, the muscle biopsy is also very helpful um, to determine if you have one of these other autoimmune uh, um, forms of myositis. So I'm going to go into, since I said about 40%, 40 to 45% in the myositis world will have overlap with scleroderma, we want to better understand what those other autoimmune conditions are of the forms of myositis. So we said polymyositis, dermatomyositis, inclusion body myositis, and this immune media necrotizing myopathy. I'm not going to talk about inclusion body myositis because this typically, I've, I've never seen it um, in patients with scleroderma. That would probably be reportable. Um, it's a very insidious kind of slow um, form of myositis, and there's unfortunately no treatment, uh, but it's typically seen in male patients more greater than 65 is a very slow process, of probably like 10 to 15 years gradual decline, unfortunately. Because um, I'm going to focus in my talk on more polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and immune media necrotizing myopathy. So dermatomyositis is very easy to diagnose in a sense from a physician perspective because you typically will have a rash. And I do have patients who have scleroderma with, like I said, overlap, true overlap myositis. And the dermatomyositis is very, you know, easy to look, uh, diagnose because you have the classic rash. So this classic rash that we describe here um, on the knuckles is called Gotrin's papules. And it's going to be red, itchy, and scaly. Now it could be misdiagnosed as psoriasis, so it's important that you know your doctor is on the lookout for that. Um, the other uh, skin manifestations you see in dermatomyositis is this, you know, shawl sign we say in the back of the neck as well. And the muscle biopsy, this comes back to why the muscle biopsy is important. In dermatomyositis, it's all of the forms of myositis have different muscle biopsy classic features on the muscle biopsy. And in dermatomyositis, we say you have perifascicular atrophy is a classic finding on the muscle biopsy. And you can see here what that means is in this fascicle area, you can see these myofibers are atrophied, smaller, compared to the ones in the middle. So that's called the perifascicular atrophy. You can also see perivascular inflammation. Remember, the muscle is very vascular. So you can see the blood vessel right in the middle, and you can see all these uh, blue-purple cells. The inflammatory cells are all around the blood vessel, and you get perivascular inflammation. So you can see that in overlap with scleroderma. 
Another one would be the polymyositis. This is really a diagnosis of exclusion. In the myositis world, I would have to say this has really kind of become uh, uh, like a, uh, I don't want to say like a trash bag term, but like um, it's really a diagnosis of exclusion. In the old days, I would say, um, you know, uh, someone would just say you have polymyositis if your muscle enzyme was high and um, you had some mild weakness. But really, you know, to be more robust and to be more accurate, polymyositis, usually you should have evidence of inflammatory cells, like in this picture on the muscle biopsy, uh, or what we call primary inflammation, where the inflammatory cells are invading the muscle fiber here. You can see all around. And in polymyositis, it's a little bit more difficult to diagnose. And of course, because of that, I think a lot of people in the past would have said, like, again, if you just have mild weakness and elevated CK, oh, you have polymyositis without any biopsy. But remember that just because you have elevated CK and muscle enzymes, I'm sorry, elevated CK or muscle enzymes and muscle weakness doesn't mean you have an autoimmune muscle condition, right? You can have, you know, a neuromuscular disease, a genetic muscle disease, um, or you could have taken statin medications and um, you could have had muscle breakdown, or you could have had... Um, severe thyroid problems, and you can make, that can also cause muscle weakness and elevated CK. So it's really become a diagnosis of exclusion. And so if I see anybody with, you know, polymyositis, supposedly, where you have weakness and elevated CK, but you don't have a rash, uh, we always do a muscle biopsy to figure out what's going on. <clears throat> uh, the third one that I'm going to talk about is this immune-mediated uh, necrotizing myopathy. Um, and for, you know, uh, to shorten it, it's just really a necrotizing myositis or myopathy. Um, necrotizing myopathy usually is a very severe form of muscle disease. And unlike polymyositis or dermatomyositis, the itis, the inflammation, um, the ne there actually is necrosis of the muscle fibers. So you can see here, like, in this uh, picture, these muscle, muscle fibers are being degraded or degenerating. And again, muscle can regenerate, however. It doesn't matter if this, you know, your muscle tissue looks like this, it can regenerate, uh, which is the good news about the muscle. And so people who have this necrotizing myopathy typically have very uh, high muscle enzymes. So I think the highest CK I've seen is you know, 150,000, um, 50,000. Um, but I've seen the necrotizing myopathy even in patients with CK of 2,000. So, and these patients typically tend to get early fatty replacement or damage, so it's very important to um, treat it aggressively early on. Um, and as I reported earlier about checking myositis autoantibodies, the two more common ones outside of the world of scleroderma is this SRP, signal recognition particle, and the HMGCR antibody. And why this is important, these two are the ones that are most associated with an autoimmune necrotizing myopathy. And this one, the HMGCR, is typically associated with statin exposure. So if you're taking Lipitor, I have people um, who are taking Lipitor and they get a very high muscle enzymes and uh, they stop the Lipitor uh, and it doesn't get better. And in fact, they get so weak, um, the doctor's wondering, oh, well, we stopped your, you know, uh, torvastatin, why are you still weak? And so there is an autoimmune form of this necrotizing myopathy, where it's not just the statin is directly having a toxic effect, but it actually causes a cascade of an autoimmune response in the muscle and causes you to have an autoimmune muscle disease or muscle inflammation or this kind of severe necrotizing myositis. So these people tend to have more severe muscle disease. Now, I gave you examples of these two, HMCR and SRP, but actually, um, you know, now you know, we tend to do, you know, more muscle biopsies in patients with scleroderma, not always, um, but if we do, we have seen um, more necrotizing biopsies, in which case we really want to treat it aggressively so you don't get fatty replacement or damage. Okay, next slide. Okay, so then that's kind of the background um, of what we know about muscle disease in scleroderma and in kind of overall in autoimmune diseases. Um, so the next step was for us to figure out, well, you know, what about in our scleroderma center? 
what happens to people who have muscle weakness. So what we did was we queried our large uh, cohort of patients, of uh, 2,481 patients from 1990 to 2010, and the study included about 1,700 patients. And we wanted to see who had muscle weakness and what happens to these patients. Are they, do they have more disability? Do they have more higher mortality? Because again, in one of the first slides, I described that myopathy or muscle disease in scleroderma is a poor prognostic feature in scleroderma. So um, what we found was that people, and how we defined um, muscle weakness was if somebody had a score, a muscle severity score, of greater than or equal to one. And this means four out of five strengths is that you had at least mild weakness. And four is the more severe where you're actually using ambulation aids. Um, and we looked at the outcome of uh, the health assessment questionnaire, which is a validated patient-reported outcome of disability. And what we found was we had about 392 patients who had muscle weakness based on that definition, and then 1326 who didn't have any weakness. And I know this is a bit of a busy slide, but I'm just going to highlight in yellow that when we have these large numbers, we can actually try to figure out is it even um, statistically significant. I know that comes up a lot in research articles. And that comes up because if you have small numbers, it's harder to tell, is this really meaningful? And so we use this you know, a statistical program to actually very uh, rigorously analyze the data to figure out if this really means something. And so what we found in those who have weakness is that patients tend to have a earlier age of onset, just a little bit. Um, we, and we have a referral bias probably because of where we are, but um, uh, there tend to be more African-American patients. Um, the duration of disease in patients who have scleroderma and muscle weakness tended to be shorter, and not surprisingly, um, patients tended to be of more diffuse subtype. Um, and that's been reported in the past literature as well that I described to you back in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. But that was what we found in our own cohort as well. Uh, other features would be that some of our patients, uh, it's not clear why, but um, they had more severe GI involvement, higher risk of renal crisis, more joint inflammation, I'm sorry, uh, more lung disease, um, more cardiac uh, problems. Um, I'm sure you guys do your echoes, echocardiograms yearly, um, which is recommended for all scleroderma patients, um, where the ejection fraction or the pump function of the heart was less, um, less than 50%, more commonly less than 50% in patients who had muscle weakness. And the CK, again, um, tended to be higher in those who had muscle weakness, which is not surprising because if somebody has muscle weakness, and um, it, not everybody will have an elevated CK, but it's typically ex you would expect that. Interestingly, if you had the centromere antibody, you tended to be more protected against having muscle weakness. So it was found in those who were not weak. But um, another thing would be if... Uh, there was a higher uh, risk of death in those who had muscle weakness, which is just supporting, you know, previous studies that there, while it is an underappreciated manifestation, there may, potentially may be a poor prognosis. Uh, but in our court, it was not statistically significant. And then the D hack di which is the health assessment questionnaire, score was higher. So not surprisingly, um, you know, patients who have muscle weakness will be, uh, will feel more, uh, dis disabled. And so you can see here, I think there's a really, uh, almost like a linear relationship where as you get weaker, uh, zero means no weakness, one means mild weakness, two means, you know, moderate, and four is if you, you use ambulation aids. Um, you can see that the disability score gets higher, as you can see. Um, and, you know, uh, the average disability score in osteoarthritis is 0 0.8, and in rheumatoid arthritis is 1.2. So you can see that patients with muscle weakness and scleroderma certainly have much higher disability scores. So, um, and that's important to know. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so the take-home points from our first dis 
this first study would be that patients with muscle weakness are more likely to have diffuse scleroderma, shorter disease duration. Um, so early on the disease, uh, because treatment can make a big impact um, in, su in some subsets of the form of myopathy, you want to try to look for it earlier in the disease process than later. Um, and then you could, uh, there was higher, uh, more likely to have restrictive lung disease of FEC of less than 70%, severe GI involvement, and higher CK values. And again, muscle weakness independently associates with disability. Uh, I didn't mention this, but some people will be like, well, you know, if I have rheumatoid arthritis, of course I'm going to be more disabled. But, and since we know that, we actually controlled for those things. We can do that in a statistical, rigorous statistical analysis. And even after you control for all these uh, features, like other things that could cause disability, it still panned out that the muscle weakness um, had a, a big contributor, was a big contributor to disability. Okay. So the next study that, you know, offshooted from that first study would be, well, we have all these patients who have muscle weakness. Well, what, what is the reason for their muscle weakness? So we found that in our cohort of patients, we had muscle biopsies. So we wanted to figure out what was the muscle biopsy findings in these patients with muscle disease. So our uh, study included patients obviously with scleroderma, and uh, you had to have muscle weakness, and a muscle biopsy read at our institution. Um, we did that because you know, we wanted to be uniform and um, uh, the same read um, by the person who read it on the muscle biopsy, because it could be you know, uh, a person reads a muscle biopsy, not a computer. So. So we had about 65 patients who had muscle biopsy, and 42 of them had muscle biopsies read our institution. Um, and again, this is just kind of the baseline clinical characteristics of these patients. Tended to be more African American, more diffuse scleroderma, and um, higher risk of pulmonary, an RVSP that was greater than 40. Okay, so what is, this is more interesting. What is the spectrum of the muscle biopsy findings in these weak scleroderma patients? And remember, we, I talked about the EMG in the beginning. So when they put the needle in the muscle, it should be electrically silent if it's normal. If it makes a lot of sound, because the needle is a microphone into the muscle to figure out what's going on, there's a lot of irritation, that means. And so we found that about 48% of these 42 patients, or 19 out of 42, had an irritable or a lot of irritation in the muscle on the EMG. Surprisingly, um, we were surprised that they also had abnormal Searle studies. And so I, mentioned, I may have mentioned this before, but the Searle nerve is the longest nerve that comes out of the spine. So if you have any nerve problem, that would be the first nerve to go down. And so we found that some of these patients had no response, some of them had, some of them had low responses, and so about 43% had some abnormal nerve problem. And then <clears throat> we try to be very rigorous in a sense that we said, okay, let's find out what are the individual muscle biopsy features we found on these patients. And a lot of them had you know, inflammation, 47%, and necrosis, which is the cell myofiber muscle cell death but can regenerate, and then also um, nerve findings of neurogenic atrophy. But if you actually had to put all of those individual features together, and say, what is the bottom line in these 42 patients? What is the bottom line in terms of the histological or biopsy category we found? And we found it was nonspecific myositis and a necrotizing myositis. So previously, necrotizing um, myositis or myopathy was typically not thought to be found in scleroderma patients. But actually, we found that you could find it up to 20% in our, in our cohort in the study. So it's something to, um, and and something to um, take heed of because you would treat people differently based on these findings in terms of the muscle disease. And this is a schematic of you know, uh, perivascular information we see with dermatomyositis. This is a little bit harder to see, but this is published in our study, perifascicular atrophy, which is a classic finding in dermatomyositis. In E, oh, I didn't mention this, but in E, I thought, so we also looked for, because we know in scleroderma, the skin has a lot of fibrosis, right? And you also get fibrosis or scar in not only the skin, but also in the lung and other organs. So we wanted to say, okay, is there a unique group of patients who only have 
scar or fibrosis in the muscle tissue. And we only had three, so it was a very low percentage. But I will go on to tell you why this, I'm mentioning this now. And so we call this fibrosis only on muscle biopsy or a fibrosing myopathy. Um, okay. And this is an example of a lot of fibrosis here, all this blue around the muscle fibers. Okay. <clears throat> and this last one is these, uh, if you have nerve damage that's contributing to muscle fibers. So this is muscle biopsy is very helpful in some instances because you can actually tell if, if someone is not sure if you're weak because hopefully you don't have to have a biopsy to determine that, but um, you could tell if there's nerve damage. Uh, nerve damage is causing the muscle fibers um, to contribute to your weakness. And those are the angulated fibers we typically describe in those um, if you have a nerve problem. So the take-home points thus was, again, nonspecific myositis and this necrotizing form of myopathy was common. And we found that um, nerve damage was also seen on the muscle biopsies, which was very surprising. Um, and it can happen, muscle disease can happen early, early in the onset of scleroderma, um, especially in those who have polymyositis, this PMSCL antibody that I described before, and SCL70 antibody. So this is <clears throat> the last study I'm going to talk about. Um, so this fibrosing myopathy is very, in, um, is very interesting in that we think this is really unique to the scleroderma patients, um, and I'll explain why. So around this time when all this, the paper was, we published that paper, and for some reason we were having a lot of people, uh, scleroderma patients had muscle weakness. And every time we would biopsy them, I would notice that um, they had a lot of fibrosis. So then we went back and said, okay, what are the different uh, features, okay, in scleroderma features of these people who have fibrosing myopathy or just fibrosis around the muscle fiber? So we went back and compared them to those who have the more inflammatory form of my, uh, muscle disease or, for example, polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and the necrotizing myopathy. And what we found was that in, in small numbers, uh, but we we have accrued more patients now, but um, in the fibrosis only group, you see it's more diffuse scleroderma, patients who are more African American. Um, duration of follow up was much shorter because there was a high risk of, unfortunately, death. Um, and this was important to us uh, because if somebody has a fibrosing myopathy, when we see it, um, it means that we have to uh, look for other things, meaning. Why, we wanted to figure out why these patients um, were dying. And the main reason was because we found um, these patients had elevated troponin, meaning that the cardiac muscle was also getting scarred as well. So in this small group, um, we found that patients who had this fibrosing myopathy tended to have more cardiac involvement. And another interesting thing is, unlike our patients with the myositis, the more inflammatory form of um, the muscle disease. Our patients with fibrosis only on muscle biopsy or fibrosing myopathy had lower muscle enzymes. Um, so in, and in some of my patients actually had normal muscle enzymes. So that goes to show that if, if you have weakness but normal enzymes in scleroderma, you still want to be sure that there's no ongoing muscle disease. The other autoantibodies that we typically saw was the topoisomerase, U3 RMP antibody. And I just wanted to show you again, this is a normal muscle biopsy, and this is what we found in our fibrosing patients. You can see here clearly this, this scar. It's almost like the muscle myofibers are encased in this fibrosis, basically. And you can see here that these muscle, muscle fibers then be, are myopathic, and those means that those, these nuclei that should be around the um, muscle fibers are in the inside of the muscle fibers. But I think the take-home point for this picture is that there's a lot of scar around the muscle fiber. And then again, um, that there was a higher risk of mortality in those with fibrosing myopathy. And a classic example of one of my patients here would be um, that there's cardiac uh, fibrosis in the muscle tissue of the heart muscle. And you can see it here in these arrows that they had some fibrosis. 
thereby leading to cardiomyopathy. So the treatment of fibrosing myopathy, we still don't know what the vest is. Of the eight patients, five patients were deceased, but um, I do have three patients who are living, and two out of three patients are doing very well on MMF or mycophenolate and IVIG. So if I see this on muscle biopsy, I'm very aggressive about treating it um, because, I mean, our goal is always um, to make an impact on the treatment um, so that people will do well. So the take-home points from our study is that um, fibrosis predominance on muscle biopsy is, represents a unique subset of patients with myopathy and scleroderma. Um, fibrosis myopathy patients tend to have higher mortality, and you may have lower muscle enzymes, um, and they may, you may have a high, uh, patients who have uh, fibrosis myopathy may have a higher risk of death, and some of the autoantibodies you could potentially find, again, this is a small number of patients, and we're trying to prospectively confirm this moving forward, maybe U3 RMP antibody, which you can check for, your doctor can check for, or the topoisomerase antibody. So um, I think I'm getting close to, uh, to time's up. Sorry, if I didn't realize I was talking so long. <laughs> uh, the conclusions of this talk would be that the spectrum of the muscle disease is very heterogeneous, and so a very thorough workup is very important, I think. Um, and um, again, if you do end up having a muscle biopsy, remember it could, the reason for doing it would be that if you have a necrotizing myopathy that, or a fibrosing myopathy, you know, we would typically try to be more aggressive about treatment because the muscle can regenerate. That's the beautiful thing about the muscle. If we treat it aggressively, we can get it better and you can get stronger. Um, the myopathy so far doesn't seem to be autoantibody specific but require further study. And yes, patients with myopathy can have poor outcomes, such as disability, but if you treat it, we can make it better. And I think this is going to be something we need to confirm moving forward. But there is a subset of patients we clearly see that have this fibrosing myopathy or a lot of fibrosis that can lead to higher mortality, another reason why we want to know about it so we can treat it. And I think that's it. And I just want to thank you know, the Scleroderma Center where I work, and I also work at the Myositis Center um, to my mentors. Um, Dr. Wigley, Dr. Hummers, and Dr. Mammon, um, especially. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pack. Um, we really, really appreciate the um, a very informative talk. Um, we do have some questions that have come up. I, we might run a little bit over on time, if that's okay with you, yeah, um, just so we can try and address what we can. Um, so um, we'll try and kind of just wrap it up right around 11 o'clock if we can, but, um, or Pacific time. But um, we, like I said, we may run just a, a little bit over. Um, some questions that have come up um, through the talk. Um, somebody asked, is a PT useful for myopathy, um, seeing a physical therapist, and, and is there um, an alternative to that? Yes, um, absolutely. Physical therapy. So in the myositis world, um, there's this kind of old thinking that if you're CK, your muscle enzymes are really high, your doctor will be like, no, you, you really shouldn't exercise because your muscles, it, it'll get worse. But in reality, what we've seen is that people actually, one aspect of the disease is if you have muscle inflammation, yes, we want to treat it. But um, if you don't use your muscles, then you're going to lose it. So we say, you know, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. So if you pair up with a really good physical therapist who's not going to try to make you exercise like you just had a you know, knee surgery, a simple knee surgery, but who knows about the disease process, it would be very helpful to, you know, be treated for the muscle disease but also do physical therapy and to exercise and to keep those muscles very well perfused and um, keep moving. So, yes, absolutely, that's a good idea. Um, somebody was asking um, that they were diagnosed with polymyositis and then it's, it seems to have resolved. Is that, is that possible or does it, does it just kind of lay dormant or...? No, so again, um, with the polymyositis, yes, it can, once you get treated for it, you can certainly, because a member of the muscle can regenerate, it can mm -hmm. completely go into remission. So I have people, um, if we're not using the immunosuppressants to treat your scleroderma, uh, because the scleroderma is less active, like in the skin or the lung, and we were just only using the immunosuppression to treat the muscle disease, um, and you're doing really well, then I start to taper off these medications. Uh, because the muscle disease can go into remission. Okay. Um, I, guess, I guess along those lines, too, is there, is there a limit on how much physical activity you should be doing, or should that, that be limited? Um, is I there a negative say, impact um, on that? <clears throat> I always say, you know, um, just do as much you can, but don't go overboard. So if you weren't training for a marathon, then don't suddenly run, you know, <laughs> like 10 miles the next day. Just kind of gradual. 
um, mm -hmm. to the point where you're able to, you know, move and exercise, but not a severe uh, workout, basically. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, the last part of your talk, you were um, talking about the fibrosis myopathy. Is there, are there any preventative measures that can be taken, you know, when you're seeing the higher levels of the, um, I'm going to say it wrong, troponin, um, as, it, as you indicated? Um, oh, yes, that's an excellent question. So if we find that you have cardiac involvement, so let's say you're a patient who has either myositis or fibrosing myopathy, and we check your troponin, and we're, uh, we tend to track troponin now if we're concerned, you're saying you have shortness of breath with, and we know you have muscle disease, then we're, we then usually pursue a cardiac MRI um, or try to figure out why your cardiac muscle enzyme is elevated because that would really change management. So mm -hmm. I think an early blood test marker to check for that in sort of a preventative way so that you don't get heart inflammation and scar would be to check that troponin level um, because that could give us insight into what other workup we need to do to prevent any um, heart failure or other complications from heart disease. Okay. Um, Somebody is asking, uh, do you have patients with specific neck or upper back weakness um, and, and holding their head straight? Is that a, is that a um, indication of the myopathy? Yes. Or, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So I do have patients who have isolated head drop um, mm -hmm. where the neck, you can't lift up your uh, neck uh, by yourself. Um, and then I also have uh, other patients who have concomitant uh, hip flexor, like thigh weakness. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. neck flexor weakness. So those are the proximal mus mu muscles that I showed before where the neck could be weak plus the arms and the legs. Mm -hmm. so, but I do also have isolated head drops, so it's a different thing. <clears throat> so uh, that could happen. Okay, got it. Um, I have somebody asking, and I'm trying to be careful not to, to direct any, like give any uh, specific medical advice, but is um, muscle spasms and, and muscles of the um, abdominal, the, the, it sounds like the extremities and then some abdominal muscle issues, um, magnesium levels are normal. Are there other reasons that, would, that could cause that kind of, um, those kind of uh, muscle issues? Ah, so muscle spasms. That's a very mm -hmm. hard one. Uh, muscle mm -hmm. spasms is so common. Um, if you, um, if the magnesium levels are normal and we can't find any other reason, like any uh, true muscle disease um, by doing EMG or uh, uh, further workup to figure out why you may have muscle spasms, um, then sometimes, unfortunately, muscle spasms are very difficult. The other thing, sometimes we don't know the reason. We can never find out. But um, sometimes it's because... Um, if you're on steroids for a long time. I see that mo the most common reason for me when I see my patients would be if you're on prednisone for a long mm -hmm. time or high doses, that can certainly cause muscle spasms. But there is a kind of protocol workup we typically do for muscle spasms. And so if that's all negative, then we say we just kind of treat the symptoms, unfortunately. There's a whole uh, center for muscle spasms in certain uh, academic centers because <laughs> it's difficult to diagnose, to find Got out it. the reason sometimes. Um, and I'll just do a couple more questions and then we'll rest, uh, wrap up. Um, testing for antibodies, can the results change as the disease progresses? Uh, you mean in, um, in scleroderma and myositis specific? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> not typically. Um, I was gonna, the, the reason why I'm hesitating is in people who have the one I was telling you about, the necrotizing myopathy, Mm -hmm. um, in uh, statin exposure, we've seen that people's titers go down with treatment of the muscle disease. But okay. like uh, in other conditions, in other forms of myositis, it's typically not. We okay. haven't seen that yet in our, the fibrosing group, um, but that's something as a future study that we should be doing. Okay. Um, let's see. I want to make sure. Um, I think we've addressed most of the questions that we have. Um, can you get dirt? Uh, dermatomyositis on your face? That was one of the yes. earlier questions. Yes, absolutely. So the skin findings of dermatomyositis uh, could be you can get purplish discoloration over the eyelids. That's called heliotrope rash, named after, the, named after the flower that looks like purplish in color. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can also get like this flush over the, uh, the, like the, almost like the butterfly rash, like in lupus, 
But the uh-huh. butterfly rash in lupus typically spares the nasolabial folds, but in dermatomyositis it doesn't. Interesting. Um, and you can also get other areas like the neck, uh, the arms, the, the sides of the thighs we call holster sign. Um, if severe enough, it could be whole body erythroderma where it's, your entire body is very red, looks like you have sunburn. So there's a whole wide range, but you can definitely get it on the face. Okay, got it. I think we've I've tried to address as many of the questions as we could. I think we've we've gotten to most of them. Um, so thank you once again for your time. Uh, oh, absolutely. Really it's such a great pleasure talk. and honor to be here. Yeah, yeah, we know we really appreciate it. Um, so just for, the, for our audience out there, um, please uh, be sure to check our website for our upcoming webinars in 2018. Um, and note too on our site, we have all of our past sessions um, on there as well for you to, uh, to view um, at your convenience. They're all free of charge. Um, so I think that's going to be it, and we're going to wrap it up today, uh, for today. Thank you again, Julie, so much. Um, okay. and then, Thank you very much. Um, you're welcome. And then um, just a reminder, we welcome all, um, any feedback that you might have. So there's a short survey as you, um, as you close out. And then um, please remember that we depend on your support to continue our investment in the most promising research. So for more information, visit us online at srfcure.org or call our offices at 1-800-441-CURE to support our program. Thanks again for sharing time with us today, and we look forward to our next session and having you join us. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.